for the the delay here. We were having some technical issues. Um, we're pleased to be uh, joined today uh, by Brigadier General Anderson, uh, Canadian Armed Forces, serving as part of our coalition uh, efforts um, in in Iraq, uh, helping to uh, to uh, do the training uh, in leading up to the uh, the battle for Mosul uh, and beyond. Uh, General, just want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Great, sir. Thank you. We'll turn it over to you for uh, any opening comments you have, and uh, we'll take uh, questions from the reporters here on this side. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brigadier General Dave Anderson of Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve, where, as I, where I work as the director of training, or what we call the CJ-7 which includes both the Partner Force Development Cell and the Canadian-led Ministerial Liaison Team. As the Coalition continues to support operations to seize Mosul, I'd like to provide you some insight to our train and equip mission, which has enabled our partner successes against Daesh and their readiness to liberate Mosul in the near future. Just over a year ago, Daesh controlled 18% of the population, to include the Euphrates River Valley from the Syrian Turkish border, almost to the edge of Baghdad province, and the Dorit city of Ramadi. When Daesh invaded the country in 2014, the Iraqi army they faced was well versed in addressing what they believed was the greatest threat, an insurgency, and were not prepared for the conventional assault by Daesh. We watched Daesh assault Iraq with massed fighters, convoys, and heavy equipment, taking thousands of kilometers of terrain and driving millions of people from their homes, and my directorate is the coalition's hand in ensuring that it is never repeated. With the establishment of the Combined Joint Task Force, the operation focused on two main goals, train and advise Iraqi security forces and enable military defeat of Daesh, most often illustrated in the more than 15,000 airstrikes systematically targeting military commanders, weapons facilities, tactical units, media centers, and revenue producing oil refineries. Concurrently, the Iraqi forces were reconstituted and my directorate began executing an ambitious plan approved by the government of Iraq to train and equip the Iraqi security forces at five different building partner capacity training sites or BPC sites across Iraq. Our training shifted away from a counterinsurgency approach towards a more combined arms maneuver approach by teaching the Iraqis how to integrate infantry, armor, artillery, engineers, aviation and other combat multipliers to achieve an overwhelming advantage on the battlefield. In addition to the five training sites located at Al-Assad, Takadam, Taji, Besmaya, and Baghdad, Partner Force Development has grown significantly to manage the Iraq Train and Equip Fund, or ITEF. These funds are available to provide assistance to Iraqi military and other security forces to include training, equipment, logistic support, supplies, and ammunition. ITEF equipment is ordered based on documented requirements and is distributed according to operational priorities. This provides the commander with the sustainment flexibility and has enabled US and coalition forces to offer basic proficiency in combat training to more than approximately 45,000 Iraqi forces to date. Since its inception in 2015, the fund has expended close to $1.6 billion to train and equip over 54,000 members of the Iraqi security forces, including over 26,000 Iraqi army soldiers, 8,500 counterterrorism service soldiers, 12,000 Peshmerga, and over 5,800 federal police and border security soldiers. I'd like now to go ahead and answer the anticipated question of whether the Iraq security forces are ready for Mosul by first confirming that each brigade that will participate in Mosul will have completed some coalition training. And then I would like to describe broadly what is accomplished at these BPC sites. To date, the coalition has trained 12 brigades, which includes anywhere from 800 to 1,600 troops with a varied period of instruction depending on the type of capability that the brigade needs. We provide these brigades with individual equipment packages that include personal protective equipment such as body armor, helmets, and M16s. Each unit also receives a complement of up-armored and soft-skinned vehicles. Training of the Iraqi security forces and anti-ISIL forces includes a tailored approach based off of the needs of the unit and at the request of the government of Iraq and is informed by coalition advice. 
One example is an eight-week curriculum, which includes counter-ID techniques, observation topography, leadership, map reading, mechanized weapons, chemical training, squad formation tactics, machine guns, basic mortar, urban operations, weapons handling, night training, and squad level tactical training. Other shorter packages can be tailored to focus other specific skills, such as offensive building searches, booby trap clearance, combat medics course, and advanced marksmanship. Iraqi forces that have been trained at the BPC sites have demonstrated greater resilience than those not trained at BPC sites. And these taught tactical formations are at the vanguard of counterattack operations, demonstrating that the Iraqi leadership regards them highly. The Iraqis have proven time and again they can and will conduct compl uh, complex and decisive operations and that they have the will to defeat Daesh. Right now, the Iraqi security forces continue to clear and secure the Jazeera Desert, recently liberating the town of Abu Diab north of Ramadi and the Dulab Peninsula. Plans being finalized for the Mosul liberation while shaping operation, operations, positioning of forces, logistics and ammunition and the relentless employment of coalition strikes all set the stage for success in Mosul. Following the inevitable liberation of Mosul, it will take an estimated 30 to 45,000 hold forces for such a large city, employing local police who will serve as the face of security for Iraq. We have stepped up our emphasis on police training and recruiting tribal forces, adding 5,000 local police and over 20,000 tribal fighters. These men will be the key to holding gains and protecting the newly liberated Iraqi citizens, and soon over a million more to be freed from Daesh oppression in Mosul. Identifying, training, and equipping the police forces is currently my directorate's top priori priority, as we see the final Mosul Brigade has just entered BPC training. Just this week, the Ministerial Liaison Team participated in a military police chief's conference from the five recently liberated provinces to discuss their plan for police forces of all kinds and how we can assist them. Similar sessions will occur regularly with the next focused on counter-ID preparedness. Each day the government of Iraq is closer to accomplishing its goal of liberating Iraqis from the hold of Daesh. The coalition will continue to support the Iraqi government and Iraqi forces to execute their plan to liberate Mosul at a time of their choosing. Concurrently with the operations to liberate Mosul, my team will continue assisting the Iraqis in developing the necessary forces and training to ensure the long-term security and success of the sec of Iraqi security forces. Now I'll be happy to take your questions. We'll start with uh, Courtney Cuby from NBC News. Uh, hi, General. Uh, so you mentioned the 12 brigades of anywhere between 800 to 1,600 troops for Mosul. Since that's a, a pretty wide range of 9,600 to almost 20,000, what, what is the, the, the estimated number, actual number of Iraqi security forces it will take to begin for the Mosul operation? Well, first of all, it's the government of Iraq's plan uh, to take Mosul. And second of all, I'm, I'm not going to go through the specifics of the, of the troop numbers. Um, I will say that every one of the brigades that will uh, participate in the seize force has been through our training and equipping. The final brigade is going through the, the BPC training right now? That's correct. It has a shortened uh, period of instruction of, uh, of uh, three weeks to make sure that it has just the skills and equipment that it needs uh, to be launched. And when will that three weeks be, be completed? Uh, they've just started. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're about a week into it. And then if, I, if it's okay, if I just ask one more, the, um, can you give us any, any sense of the breakdown, the 12 brigades of um, ethnicity? Um, actually, I, I don't know specifically the, uh, the ethnicity of each of the brigades. I actually don't. I know that within local police forces, we strive for and achieve about a 50-50 split uh, between uh, Sunni and Shia. Um, but I honestly don't know what the ethnicity, uh, ethnical, ethnic background is. And, and you know what? It's not really all that important uh, because nothing unites a force like a common enemy, particularly one that's, that's uh, as evil as Daesh is. Uh, I'm sure that they're united in their fight uh, and united with one single goal, which is to defeat Daesh 
and defeat their fellow citizens from its oppression. Great. Uh, next, we'll go to Carlo Munoz with the uh, Washington Times. Hey, sir. Thanks for uh, taking the time to do this. Uh, one quick question on the 30 to 45,000 uh, member whole force. You said that's going to be consisting of local police and sort of tribal militias or paramilitary forces. What Can you go into detail as far as what some of these local tribal groups I mean? Are they part of the PMUs that we've been hearing about? Are these just local provincial sort of peacekeeping forces? Can you go into a little more detail on that? And I also have a follow-up. Yeah, sure. Uh, so those tribal forces are, are predominantly local tribal forces. Some of them we've equipped, some of them we've trained and equipped. The most important thing is that they've all been vetted. Uh, nobody goes through, goes through our equipping or training without uh, being vetted. The important thing is, is, is that they're local, and that is the key, uh, particularly for Mosul and the Meslawis who are about to be liberated. Uh, it needs to be uh, people from the area and of the area. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, it does, sir. Um, and also, um, just a quick question on, on what you just said earlier. You said nothing sort of unites uh, these forces like a common enemy. Now, um, we've heard repeatedly that with the defeat of Daesh in Mosul, that pretty much is going to not wrap up the coalition mission there, but it's sort of one of the last remaining priorities to defeat Daesh and Iraq. Now, with that defeat, there goes your common enemy. So I guess how are you training these hold forces to kind of maybe address some of the issues that could come up when, you know, Daesh is, is defeated in, in Mosul and some of the old uh, sectarian rifts sort of start re-emerging there. Um, so Mosul is going to fall, there's no doubt about, doubt about it, and it is one of the two capitals of the so-called caliphate, uh, the other one being in Iraq, uh, in uh, Raqqa. But the fall of Mosul does not mean that Daesh is defeated by any stretch of the imagination. It just means it's defeated in its current format. Its co uh, capacity to conduct conventional, uh, conventional operations has been, has been defeated, but not Daesh itself. And we fully expect uh, that it will uh, dissipate into the, into the urban terrain and into the, uh, uh, into the population, and that we're going to be fighting uh, an insurgency and uh, counterterrorism operations, more importantly the Iraqis will, uh, for a while yet. So uh, it's definitely not over. If anything, it's going to be more difficult. The period between the day after Mosul and the day after Daesh is probably when it's, when it's most dangerous. Just one quick follow-up, sir. You know, you're talking about this upcoming or pending, looming um, counterinsurgency fight. Do you think, as uh, from the BPC perspective, you've swung the pendulum a little too far towards training and equipping the Iraqi forces preparing them for more conventional modes of warfare and kind of leaving their coin and CT capabilities by the wayside? That's actually a very, very astute question. Um, what most Western militaries found as they had to learn how to do insurgency is the bedrock of being able to do counterinsurgency is a solid fundamental of conventional operations. And so that, that helps us there. But we are already retooling both our periods of instruction and the sort of equipment that we'll deliver so that once Mosul is, is seized, we can pull forces out of there uh, and uh, retrain them and retool them so that they're ready to face the next fight. And that work and planning is ongoing now. It was one of the things that I, I've, uh, I've discussed all day today. I'm in the, um, the middle of a three-day conference I'm co-chairing with the Ministry of the Interior uh, with the police chiefs of uh, five different provinces and uh, all the key leadership in the Ministry of the Interior. And literally what we've been talking about is how do we position uh, police forces and Minister of Interior forces in order to be able to fight the enemy the day after, uh, the day after Mosul um, and, and its, and its uh, uh, new metastasized uh, form, I guess. Uh, so we're working on that uh, pretty hard right now. Thank you. Uh, next to Kassim Maleri with the Turkish Anadolu. Hi, General. Thanks for doing this. My question will be, well, one of my questions was actually covered, but um, about Shia militias, to what extent uh, the Shia militias are going to be, are also trained by you guys and also will take part in this operation? My first question, I will have a follow-up.
Okay, so that's a two-part question. The first is training. Um, anybody that we train or vet uh, or equip must be vetted. And the only people that receive training or equipment for, from us are those that have been vetted. So the only militias we've trained are those that have passed our vetting process. Um, as to how they'll be employed, um, it was made clear by Iraqi law that uh, the PMF are part of the Iraqi security forces. And uh, like every other aspect of this plan, the plan to take Mosul and to secure the gains afterwards uh, resides completely with the government of Iraq. Advised and assisted by the coalition, of course, uh, but it is their plan. Uh, so it is Prime Minister Abadi's uh, plan on uh, how the PMF are going to be used in either the seizing or the securing of Mosul. And, and also, um, we, we saw in Ramadi, we saw in Beji that there was a very devastating destruction after the coalition recaptured these cities from Daesh. Uh, have you also trained those troops and also those conventional forces or those local forces not to destruct the infrastructure of the city so that the people could return as one? And second, uh, uh, of your, uh, is there any kind of missions uh, that you also trained about like um, some kind of dealing with the refugee spillover from the city? Right. Um, so <laughs> for the first question, I, I don't accept your characterization of the destruction having been for, uh, caused or predominantly by the coalition. Um, I think that we can point the finger very firmly at, uh, at Daesh um, and the substantial um, wreckage that they leave behind them with um, placing IEDs in, uh, in every single house and, and things like that, uh, destroying uh, bridges. Um, so the, the vast majority of the destruction that we saw uh, in Ramadi and places like that was actually, actually caused by the enemy. Um, as to special training to dealing with refugees, um, Soldiers are the same everywhere, whether they're uh, Canadian, uh, American, or Iraqi. Uh, at, at heart, they're citizens themselves, so they don't see refugees. Uh, what they see is Iraqi citizens. This was actually discussed today uh, in the police uh, conference that I was in, uh, where it's not about, Iraqi, uh, it's not about uh, internally displaced people. It's about Iraqi citizens. Um, and that soldier is motivated by protecting his country, just as I'm motivated by protecting mine. So he doesn't need special training to know how to treat his own people. In fact, he's eager to do so. Uh, we've, uh, we've had reports, in fact, that um, Iraqi soldiers have been using medical supplies to treat their own citizens that are moving away from the conflict zone. Uh, they clearly see it the same way that, uh, that I do. At the bottom uh, of the heart of every soldier uh, is a sheepdog who wants to protect his flock. And just last question. Uh, we, we have heard from uh, the, the officials from Baghdad, also from here, that there are about three to 5,000 uh, Daesh militants in the city, in the Mosul city. And now we are talking about more than 20,000 Iraqi uh, and Kurdish uh, forces to seize the city, as well as coalition air support. Are we a little bit overestimating Daesh because we are just fighting with 20,000 um, soldiers, as well as uh, the, all these aircrafts and other things, just to, to wipe out 3,000 to 5,000 people? Uh, two things. First of all, I haven't characterized the total number of uh, uh, forces that will be involved in the fight to seize Mosul, and that's clearly the business um, of the government of Iraq. And second of all, the only thing better than winning seven nothing is winning a hundred to nothing. Uh, there's no point in leaving anything to uh, anything to chance here. Uh, overwhelming odds always helps. Uh, nobody's looking for a close game or a tie in war. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Tara Cox of Stars and Stripes. Thank you for doing this. Um, I wanted to get back to that last uh, unit going through the BPC site right now. Um, you said it would be an abbreviated training schedule of three weeks. Um, for the Iraqi soldiers who are going through it, is this some, do they have previous experience? Are we talking about brand new fighters that will be minted soldiers after three weeks of training and sent to Mosul? No, they're, they're definitely not brand new soldiers, and they're soldiers that have been used in operations elsewhere. This is just a tune-up 
uh, for some specific skills and, and to top up their equipment before they go. Um, we, they're, they're definitely not brand new soldiers. Right, and the, the tune-up, as you put it, what sort of things will they be learning that are specific to the Mosul fight? The primary focus is on, uh, is on counter IED training uh, and movement through a counter IED uh, area. There are other things like combat life saving. Like I said, it's just the, it's the final rehearsal, if you will, uh, before going on stage. And as these units go to the BPC sites, are they partnered up with embedded U.S. or coalition advisors who then remain with those units? Or are they, are they used to working with an embedded advisor, and will that be the way they move forward to Mosul? <coughs> no, that's a great question. We've got about 700 coalition soldiers that are involved in the, in the building partner capacity sites. There, there's a separate enterprise that, uh, that does um, advise and assist. And as you know, the advise assist is predominantly being at the brigade level. Uh, and so uh, the advise and assist teams link up with the brigade leadership as they go through the training. That's the beginning of the, of the relationship. Uh, it's, we haven't trained these 12 brigades in the last six weeks. Uh, and so a, uh, a relationship is developed already before the advise and assist teams and the brigades, whichever ones are chosen, uh, they're involved in, to, uh, in the attack to seize Mosul is that that advisor then or those advisors remain with the unit as the push towards Mosul continues. Right, so once uh, a team is linked up with a brigade, it stays with the brigade if that's your question. Okay, thank you. And next we'll go to Carla Babb with DOA. Um, thanks for doing this, General. I just wanted to clarify on the numbers you said that you had trained to date. Uh, 45,000 Iraqi forces, and then you broke that down. Did you mean that as for the fight to reclaim Mosul, or did you mean that as total Iraqis over the past year and a half? Yeah, I, I meant in the total. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the specific numbers um, that are going to go into Mosul. That would... Uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, I'm not the only person watching this show. Uh, this show. My wife isn't the only person watching this coverage. Um, so we won't talk about the specific, uh, the specific numbers. But I've talked about the people that we've actually trained. I would say that you are at a number of trained Iraqi forces that can, that the Iraqis and the U.S.-led coalition feel can retake Mosul at this point. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, every confidence that, uh, that the Iraqis are developing a, a, a solid plan. I've seen various iterations of it. Um, it's just being finalized now. Um, I, I'm very confident in this plan, as are they. Um, we provide that advice and assist uh, uh, to help them. Um, and, you know, the brigade advice and assist teams, they, they assist at the brigade level. They don't actually go to the front line. Uh, but where the help is really required uh, in something like this is actually the staging and, and getting there. So I, I have every confidence uh, that, the, that this is going to be a good plan and that it's going to work. The fall of Mosul is inevitable. And one last follow-up. You had said something, I believe, about a 30,000 to 45,000 hold force. Is, did I hear that correctly? So I know you won't talk about the numbers going into Mosul, but after the liberation of Mosul, there's going to need to be about how many people remaining? Yeah, I, I did say 30 to 45, and that, that's based off uh, some uh, historical analysis of what the ratio is between security forces and a population uh, in order to provide security in what we call wide area security. And, and at first it'll be, it'll be larger um, because we'll be cleaning up the last bits of Daesh and waiting to see how it manifests itself in its, in its new role. <coughs> and then we'll find the balance. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's a balance, of course. You can't win a football game by only playing defense. You've got to play offense as well. So it's finding a balance between forces required for defense and making sure you have enough to go on the offense. And I have every, every faith that the Iraqis are looking at that and we'll get it right. Uh, next to Louis Martinez with ABC News. Hi, General. Um, thank you for hearing this briefing today. 
Um, can I ask you about those? You said that these pull forces are going to be locally, they're drawn from local populations, um, and that they've been vetted so far. Where did you get these local populations? I mean, are they from people who used to live in Mosul? Did they remain in, in integrated units? Um, or did you do recruiting um, to vet them, uh, to make sure that they were from the Mosul area? How, 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 are, how are they local? There's about uh, 8,000 uh, Ninawa police uh, that have been trained and will be employed uh, in the hold force. Um, and, and there's another 10 to 12,000, maybe a little bit more than that, of, of tribal forces. And, uh, and those will be the pr predominantly the forces that, that hold once Mosul is taken. Of course, that's right in the center. Uh, there'll be other forces that are on the outside that won't go into Mosul, uh, that, that aren't local, that will assist in securing Mosul. And if I can have one follow-on real quick. Um, you talked that once you move from the current um, operational training, if you will, the conventional force training, that you're going to quickly shift into, I guess, coin training. Uh, how long of a training process would that be for these troops? It'll depend on uh, what we do is we, we discuss it with the unit commanders and, and with the senior leadership in the, uh, in the MOD, sort of the Ministry of Defense or the Ministry of Interior, if that's the sort of forces that we're training, to determine what their needs are. Uh, baseline period of instruction that we prepared is, uh, is four weeks uh, that enables them to reorient the skills. It's not acquiring new skills. It's about acquiring uh, new ways in which to use those skills, uh, which is the trans why the transition from conventional to coin is actually easier to do than from coin to conventional. All right, so next we have Thomas Watkins of the Northwest. <coughs> Hello, General. Um, I missed just a couple of minutes of the briefing, so I apologize if uh, you were already asked this. But there was an apparent coalition airstrike this morning that killed about 20 um, Sunni tribal fighters. Uh, I was wondering if you have any details you can share with us on that, please. Yeah, uh, very little details. I, I've literally spent all day at the Ministry of the Interior. Uh, so what I can do is I, I can uh, is I can read the statement that's been handed me uh, to me. I have seen nothing on this. I haven't been to my office at all today. So just after midnight on October 5th of 2016, coalition forces conducted strikes on a position that was firing upon Iraqi security forces in the vicinity of Karab Jabbar. We are aware of the alleged reports that coalition forces mistakenly fired on Sunni tribal fighters. As with all allegations received, we were looking into this to determine the facts that surround the case. Prior to a full accounting of facts, it would be premature to speculate further on this incident. Both the coalition and the Iraqi forces are investigating this incident. We take extraordinary precautions to avoid friendly or civilian casualties, applying rigorous standards in our targeting processes, from a comprehensive analysis of all available intelligence to a careful selection of munitions. And I'm sorry, that, that's literally all that I've got. Um, it just, uh, just a quick follow-up. Um, I understand what you just said, but uh, do you have any, any indication of um, the numbers of casualties and whether there may or may not have been any civilians involved? Are you uh, still there, Pentagon? We can hear you. Can you hear us? No, I'm not here. Uh, I can hear you now. All right. 
Sorry about that, sir. We were, uh, I think you were just following up uh, uh, on a follow-on question about the uh, reported strike. I don't know if you had a, anything else on that. No, I, I didn't hear the question, but it, it wouldn't have mattered because my answer won't change. Literally, I've given all the information that I have. I don't have any more uh, information than I've already given. All right, very good. Uh, next, we'll go to Joe Tabbitt with Al Hura. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want to go back to what you said about Mosul. Could you characterize the fall of Mosul as a turning point in the war against ISIS? Uh, I think that's a very elegant way to put it, uh, because I think it, uh, it it leads to the inevitable end of Mosul in its of uh, of uh, ISIL in its current configuration. There will still be they'll still be holding terrain in Tal Afar uh, and out to the uh, Syrian uh, border. Uh, they'll still be holding terrain in the western part of the ERV in Iraq, and of course they still have the capital of their so-called caliphate in Raqqa. But it is the beginning of the end. And they know that. We've already seen signs of, uh, of uh, leaders abandoning their posts in, in Mosul uh, because they know what's, what's coming. They know that Mosul's going to fall. Quick follow-up, sir. Uh, do you see with the fall of Mosul any effect on the operations against ISIS in Syria and mainly in Raqqa? Uh, absolutely, there's a linkage between the two. Um, ideally, uh, both could be pressured at the same time, um, because I think if I was in uh, Mosul and uh, uh, I needed somewhere to go, I would go to Raqqa um, if I wanted to maintain the fight. So there is definitely a link between the two. Uh, we know that, uh, and that's the, the, the uh, coalition, the core headquarters job, uh, to put those two fights together uh, in terms of the effects. And, and you know, it's not like uh, Raqqa is not under pressure itself. Much as we have been doing shaping and preparing fires in Mosul, those continue in, in Syria, in Raqqa itself, and in the lines of communications uh, that go up the uh, Euphrates River Valley from Al Qaim up to Raqqa. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to uh, Andrew Tillman with Military Times. Hi, uh, General. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, your comment about shifting the training to um, more of a counterinsurgency? Uh, approach after Mosul. Is that something that um, is happening now? Is that something that will happen after uh, the city falls? Will that require uh, brigades and battalions to go through a new round of, of, of training, uh, new equipment being issued? Just can you give us a little bit more granular detail on what that transition will look like? Yeah, it's a little bit of all of that, and, and it's, it's, uh, we're working with the Iraqi officials now to determine what the sequence it is that they want to do. Do they want to train uh, local and, uh, police, uh, police and tribal forces first and then army forces or the other way around? Uh, and we're working through that sequence with them right now. For us, it, it doesn't really matter what sort of force shows up at the training centers uh, because um, the, the period of instruction won't change and what we're trying to teach won't, uh, won't change. Um, and, you know, we, ha we will have the capacity to start training as early as uh, the beginning of November. Uh, but the reality is, is that an awful lot of, if not most of the forces that are available, are involved in the, um, uh, the plan to take Mosul. Uh, and so uh, they're in the middle of, of uh, a pretty protracted fight while trying to prepare for the next one. I respect them, actually, for their ability to do both and do both justice. Um, so as those plans develop, we'll be ready to train them. And it will be a combination of both... Um, Tacti uh, tactics and techniques as well as equipment. And can I follow up on that? I mean, to, to what extent is, is, ha uh, is that happening in, in Anbar province? I mean, you look at a place like, uh, you know, in the Ramadi, Fallujah area, are, are wh who is there and are, and are they executing these kind of uh, counterinsurgency uh, operations or, or are you talking about beginning something more comprehensive that, that hasn't really started yet? Yeah, it's a great question. So, in essence, 
everywhere where the Iraqi security forces have made gains, they've had to secure that ground. And they've had to secure that ground against harassment uh, from Daesh. So you could argue that they're, they're conducting the defensive portion of, uh, of counterinsurgency or counterterrorism operations. Um, and, you know, the enemy is not completely flushed out uh, from the Euphrates River Valley. Uh, there's still work to be done uh, west of the Dulab Peninsula all the way out to al Qaim. Uh, take, for instance, uh, Sharkat or uh, Kiara West in the Tigris River Valley. Um, although those places have been seized and, and cleared, there is still harassment from, uh, from Daesh from the flanks um, and harassing the lines of communications. So in essence, all of the forces are doing, are holding now. And so they, they are getting the experience, it's not like they haven't had it before, of, of holding ground against an enemy that's using insurgent-like techniques uh, while the rest of the force is preparing to do conventional uh, force-on-force attack. Like I said, it's actually pretty impressive uh, because it's, a, it's the full panoply uh, of the application of force that's, that's being done. It's being done with uh, quite a bit of nuance uh, by the Iraqi leadership. Well, you made some follow-ups. Uh, Courtney Keeley, uh, NBC News. Thanks. Uh, just one quick one on back on Mosul. You've mentioned several times the extensive planning that's going on for post-Mosul, for after the city falls. Um, I understand it's an Iraqi operation, but what is your estimate in, your, in all these planning meetings, what is your estimate for how long the operations will take, for a, a rough estimate of how long it will take to actually secure the city and then clear it? I'm good, but I'm not that good. And the reason is, is that the enemy gets a vote and I don't know how he's going to vote. Uh, it could be a very, very hard and very protracted fight. Um, and, it, and it could be that they're going to put up token resistance as we've seen in other places. I, I know that the Iraqi security forces are planning on a hard fight. And I know um, with absolute certainty that we've trained them to be able to do that and we've equipped them to be able to do that. Okay, great. Uh, next to uh, Thomas Watkins with the Jean France Press. Uh, Jane, just to go back to something you were saying earlier about, about Raqqa. Um, and you Describe briefly the shaping operations that are going on there. Um, certainly from what we've been hearing, it's, we, we hear much, much less about Raqqa for obvious reasons than we do about Mosul. But I was wondering if perhaps you could elaborate a little bit more on where things are with Raqqa and how quickly post-Mosul or even during or when we could expect to see shaping operations um, and an offensive begin. The shaping operations in terms of coalition fires uh, have already started um, in, in ter and the pressure has already been placed on, on Raqqa. War, war has a timetable of its, uh, of its own um, and we're working, as you know, uh, with partners. And so that, that'll occur on, on its own timetable. Um, they, Raqqa is under pressure and we're continuing, continuing to make a difference in terms of their logistics, in terms of their uh, VBID uh, factories, uh, their command and control nodes. And that's the way that, that the coalition can keep the pressure on uh, while we're waiting for our partners uh, to develop their plan and, uh, and, cho and d launch their attack at their time of their choosing. Just, just anticipate Raqqa to be um, as difficult as Mosul or totally different? Or what's your forecast? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at the crystal ball thing. Um, I, I did mention earlier that there are, there are two capitals of the so-called uh, caliphate, um, Mosul in Iraq and, and Raqqa uh, in Syria. Um, and, and so the, they both matter an awful lot uh, to Daesh, and I think that probably Raqqa uh, matters more. Um, if Mosul falls first, there is the potential for uh, fighters to be able to reinforce into Raqqa. Uh, but beyond that, uh, it, it would be literally be crystal balling. And I don't know any more than that. This is just my, my impression of it. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, another follow-up on Mosul. You'd mentioned earlier that uh, you've seen the movement of some ISIS, I think, uh, leaders uh, departing Mosul. And I just wanted to know um, your current estimate of how many fighters are in Mosul. And are you seeing fighters depart the city, or are you seeing them uh, come back in? 
And if so, what sort of routes are they taking and what uh, steps are being taken to kind of choke off their ability to trans uh, transit into and out of the city? So, the, you know, the estimates that, that were quoted earlier by one of your compatriots, three to 5,000, that, that's probably about right. Uh, in terms of the details uh, of what's happening, my job is actually to train Iraqis to go and kill them there. Uh, my job is not so much to figure out what they're doing there. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied with the job that we're doing in terms of training and equipping and getting uh, the Iraqi security forces ready to do their job. And we'll wait and see how, uh, how Daesh responds. The Iraqi security forces are trained and equipped to deal with them no matter how hard they want to stand uh, and are ready to respond to any of the variations beyond that. And one last one on the equipping. Um, could you just outline specifically what equipment the forces have received that specific to the Mosul fight, whether it's, you know, mine rollers or whatever it would might be? I can give you some, uh, some numbers if you want. Uh, so uh, we've had about uh, 380, uh, 380 protected mobility or up-armored uh, Humvees, 60-plus um, dozers uh, the, the, that are uh, up-armored dozers. Uh, we've already brought in a, a total of, uh, of six, uh, six bridges with more on the way uh, with some, also some uh, uh, up-armored uh, non-tactical vehicles. So in, in essence, we've given them everything that they need to be able to shoot, move, and communicate, and which is all that you need to, to, to defeat an enemy. And, you know, I, I just want to go back to how good these guys are. And one thing, that you, when you're playing a team sport, you don't have to be better than the guy next to you. You just got to be better than the guy you're facing. And I have every confidence that the Iraqi security forces are better than Daesh. And uh, Carl Lucas. Uh, sir, just had one quick follow-up question again, going back to the, um, the PMFs. Uh, you mentioned that non-local uh, forces will be won't go into the city, but will be used to sort of secure the uh, the perimeter outside of the city. Has have any of those groups, um, non-local uh, militia groups, received training and or equipment via the BPC uh, mission? And uh, if so, uh, were any of these militias part of the 40 plus we've heard that are under the PMU banner that the Iraqis have sort of established? Uh, so there's a couple of parts to that question. First of all, as I keep stating, the only people that have been trained and equipped by us that are, are those that have passed some fairly stringent vetting uh, that ensure that uh, they have not only agreed to but have shown in the past respect for the law of armed conflict. Uh, there have been no human rights abuses, um, have not acted against uh, the coalition or coalition members uh, uh, beforehand. Um, so we're very, very careful about that. Um, you, you mentioned the 40-odd the, the uh, PMUs. Um, those are the various units that have been uh, raised by the provincial mobilization committees uh, that the government of Iraq has decided are part of the uh, Iraqi security forces. We're very clear on who it is we train and equip, and he gets to decide who is employed where. We've been given assurances that it will be predominantly, if not only, local forces that do the hold inside Mosul once Mosul falls. Uh, but ultimately, this is a question for Prime Minister Abadi um, and the uh, Iraqi uh, government because this is their plan. What we're doing is we're assisting them, we're enabling them, and we're helping with them with uh, training and equipping their soldiers. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Uh, General, thank you very much for your, your time today. And uh, any, any closing comments you had for us before we sign off? Um, first of all, this is, uh, this is quite the experience. I spent two years working in the Pentagon prior to coming here. Um, I, I watched this on closed circuit TV in my office, and I always felt sorry for the guy that was standing up in, fr uh, in front of the camera. So now I've been that guy. Uh, so thank you very much for that experience. Uh, but on a, on a more somber note, I have every faith the Iraqi security forces are going to get this right. I really do. Uh, Mosul's going to fall. Thank you very much, General. Thank you, everybody.